Hallelujah. This morning, I, I want to share a word with you. I'm going to try to edit this a little bit for you. The Lord laid on my heart to share some things. I did a series on spiritual warfare, and I've kind of condensed a few things here to share with you, and I think it's a lot of material. Let me just go with me to Ephesians 6. Let me just kind of set the tone for you, and then I will just pray and just share. I'm just always listening to Holy Spirit asking to lead me, to lead me. I know there's something for you. There's a word for you. You've, you've received so much ministry already. I could literally just, just quit before I start. But I just want to give you something this morning to take with you because God wants you living in a place of victory. I think it's important that we understand that and know, more importantly, how to access that, that God has given us. I know you're well taught, and some of the things I'm going to share this morning are not new. They're not new at all. I think that for some of you, it is an introduction to some of these concepts. I, I would say that when we talk about the issues of spiritual warfare, to those of you over 30, this is, you know this stuff, right? You, you grew up in it. You have a biblical worldview, and so you get it. You understand the reality of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Amen. But for those of you who are younger and more influenced by secular worldview and secular education that has crept in, I notice in the, in the emerging church this kind of, you know, I don't, I don't say we ought to be preoccupied with the devil by no means, not in God's house, but I, I also say that it is also a danger. It is a danger that we must avoid. One, that we give too much credit and attention to the devil and ascribe too much power to him. And it is equally dangerous at the same time to ignore him. I don't know if you've ever heard the saying that the devil is in the details. You've heard that saying? I think that, that it's, it's, it's what we are confronted with on a daily basis when we see the proliferation of evil around us. And these are things that science and the secular worldview have no adequate language to describe. Like the question of evil, where does it come from? What is its source? Amen. And we, we, we are in the face of some of the things that we are seeing around us. Systemic racism, unmitigated violence, the bloodlust that we see, not only that is proliferated through terrorism, global terrorism, but also through, as you can see, school shootings, shootings in the house of worship. What is all of this stuff about bullying? And I grew up being bullied all the time. I was a 98-pound weakling when I was in high school. And I was bullied, but it never once entered my mind that I should take a gun and waste everybody I, could, I see in school. You need to understand that these are not just behavioral, these are not just psychological, these are not just dysfunctional things. I submit to you that there is a real God in heaven and there is a real devil that's trying to disrupt, come on, and derail your destiny. And so I just came this morning to rip the covers off and to, to give you some weapons to fight with. Are you ready this morning? Yes. Ephesians chapter 6, a very familiar passage of scripture says that finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that we may, you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against... The cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, when, not if, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you. You are already here. Spirit of the living God, you've already begun to unfold your truth. You've already begun to manifest your presence and power. So, Father, take these few words and these few thoughts that I will share. And my Father, let them be as arrows of purpose. Let them find their mark. Somebody here needs to hear this. And so, Father, I just yield myself to you as your vessel. Take control of my lips and my tongue. Let me speak that and only that which you have purposed for me to speak in this hour. God, give me wisdom. Help me to hear your voice even as I speak. Thank you, my King and my God, that you are glorified and will forever be glorified in this house. And we give it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 
I just want to tell you today that the devil is real. Amen. And we, we, need to, we need to take heed to that fact. The biblical worldview helps us to understand that evil has a source. That evil comes from the activity of fallen angels. And the Bible gives us an entire history of Satan and his fall. In Isaiah chapter 14, uh, 12, 14 and 12 through 15, the Bible gives us this, this picture of him as an archangel in heaven. And I want to read this scripture for you because I want you to see that he's coming from a very high place. And that he understands things and the, the unseen world better than you and I ever could. But for the word of God and the revelation of the scriptures, you have no ground to stand. But here we are grateful for God's word. The Bible says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you who have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend. Send above the heights of the clouds and I will be, I will be like the most high God. Very ambitious devil, very ambitious. It wasn't enough to serve God and to have a high place in heaven, an honored place, but he wanted to be God himself. And, and, and G Jesus, Jesus made it clear. Jesus testified to the fact that the Father wasn't about to tolerate any kind of rebellion in heaven. He said in Luke 10, 18, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven and where did he fall he fell to the earth amen he fell to the earth if john 12 the, the john the apostle the beloved one who walked closely to jesus and leaned on the breast of jesus he said this now is the judgment of this world and now the ruler of this world is cast out john also got the revelation amen as god revealed it to him and then John begins, the Apostle John and Paul and others have made some statements that are important for our understanding here today. In, in Paul, in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul calls him the God of this age, the God of this age. Amen. Sometimes you need to be careful when people speak generically about God and they're trying to bring you into things. Amen. And they keep saying God, but they won't say the name, <laughs> the name, the name. Then I want to hear the name. I mean, I hear artists praying and thanking God for some of the stuff that they've produced and for the awards that they're receiving. And I'm looking at their stuff and thinking that could not have been inspired by the God that I worship. So when you say God, we need to be distinct and give me a name. Which God? Because the Bible says there is another God and he is the God of this age. I submit to you that that is the God that the world is drawing its powers from and attempting to, to, to promote themselves as if they are godly. Hallelujah. It is not the God of heaven. I want you to understand that because some of our young people are confused about, about what this God thing is about. In Ephesians 2, again, the Bible refers to Satan, this fallen angel, as the prince of the power of the air. So when we when we look at the brief history, a synopsis, we understand the Bible has much to say about where evil comes from. The Bible offers us language, more than enough language. And I want the language of the Bible to be your language. Amen. We cannot be looking to the language and thank God for psychology and all of the study of the human behavior and the mind sciences. But hear me well. You cannot ascribe every amount of evil that you see to simply to behavioralism. Amen. When you talk to a serial killer and he tells you that I enjoy killing people, you have to realize somebody else is talking to you. You're not just dealing with flesh and blood. Are you with me, somebody? Oh, that's not just dysfunction. We are talking about something else. The devil is in the details. And until we begin to understand that we are not just dealing with flesh and blood, until we begin to look behind and realize that there's, there's an unseen world that influences the seen world, we are not going to have answers, the answers that we seek for the evil that is proliferating. More importantly, you will not know how to fight what you do not understand. And so the Lord sent me here this morning to drop a few things into your mind and to, to recall for some of you seasoned saints once again, amen, some of the things you may have forgotten and set aside as it relates to this issue and the spiritual reality of evil. Now, the question is, the Bible addresses the question of who we are really fighting when we talk about evil. 
We are fighting against the unseen forces of spiritual wickedness. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7 says this, however, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful, for your adversary prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's intelligent and he's intentional. Are you there with me? He's intelligent and he's intentional. What you're fighting, what you are fighting are the schemes of the enemy. I got to give this to you. The schemes, the devil has two main tactics or schemes that he uses against people. Not just God's people. He'll, he'll go after anybody. But in particular, you who are God's people, you need to know. You need to understand how he works. The devil has two schemes. The one is temptation. The other one is accusations. The devil tempts you when you're strong so he can get you down. When he gets you down, he accuses you so you never rise again. That's how he works. He tempts anyone with power, with position or potential. That means nobody is off limits. If you just look like you're about to go somewhere, if you just look like you're about to come out of that, that lifestyle that you've been in, if you just look like you went to Nikeo this morning and God started something in you and you went home talking to people and telling them, I met God today or I, I went to a church today and I experienced something and I, I think I'm going to go back. If you just look like you have the potential to escape his clutches, how many of you know he's going to come after you? I was a good soldier when I was walking in darkness. And when I left, I know the stuff that was released against me when I walked out of that lifestyle I was living. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I used to be about that life. I thank the Lord for bringing me up out of that mess. But I thank the Lord. But don't think that the enemy's not going to come after you. He lost a good soldier when he lost me. Hallelujah. How many of you know he shows you the bait, but he never shows you the hook? Some of you are running and running and running after the stuff, and you don't understand. Don't, don't, there's a hook. Hallelujah. It's just a bait. There's a, there's a hook, and by the time you discover the hook, it's too late. Too late, too late, some of you. All of the trinkets that he waves in front of you, fame, fortune, success, just do this, and I'll make it happen for you. Listen to me. You'll not see the hook. But there is a hook, there is a hook, there is a hook, there is a hook. You need to know that there is a hook. He shows you how many bad people seem to have great lives. Isn't that another one, a way the devil tempts you? You got folk just living anyhow and somehow they seem to have everything that you need or want, right? They got the car, they got the house, they got everything, they got the connections. And you try to tell them about God and they don't see any point to you telling them about God or trying to invite them to church because all of the things that man could desire, they seem to possess. And you can sit back and look at that and say, that, what's wrong with me? What is wrong? I'm trying to serve God. And, you know, when is my day going to come? And, and you get tempted into thinking that you really don't need God that much after all. And you ignore your most important need. Come on, somebody. Amen. The greatest need in your life are not the things that are seen. It's the greatest need in your life is to know him and him crucified. I want to leave that with you. If you want to talk about being blessed, being blessed, the blessing begins with knowing him. It is to have the approval of God on your life. I submit to you that the man with all that stuff, you know, I, I'm past the point where he can make me jealous. Because Jesus said, what does it profit a man to have all that stuff? And at the end of the day, he loses his soul. Folks, let me tell you something. Eternity is long. It's long. It's long. It's long. It's long. It's long. It's long. And I'm telling you, the little pleasure that you can have here in this life is not worth the eternity that you're trading it up for. Amen. If you have eternity with God, you're going to have pleasure forever. But if you miss God, hallelujah. All that stuff that you've had waving in front of my face is not going to do you any good. Your name means nothing in hell. Come on, somebody. Your connections won't help you in hell. You won't see anybody down there. It's a lonely place. I come to tell you, don't be jealous of people who are not serving God. Don't look at their lives, but the enemy will tempt you with that. Come on, somebody. Sometimes he will cause you to look at the imperfections or the sins of Christian leaders, men who have fallen. And you might say to yourself, well, if that man of God can do that stuff and God didn't kill him. Hey, come on now. I'm about to do this here. No, I know God loves me. You know why? Because the devil, whenever he's tempting you, he always makes you minimizes the sin. He minimizes the consequence of your sin. And then he starts preaching to you the love of God and the grace of God. The devil can preach that, you know. Tell you how God is a merciful God. 
tell you how he'll forgive you. Come on. You know, did, did he not preach to Jesus? It does not your Bible say he will give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said, get thee behind me. Even in the mouth of the devil, the truth is a lie. <laughs> he will twist it. And that's how he gets you. Even in the mouth of the devil, the truth is a lie. Because he will, he will twist it. He will twist it. Come on, somebody. So he tempts you. Another way that he tempts you is, is he tries to tell you that, that you, you deserve better. The stuff you're going through, that if you were Christian, you, you should not be going through that. The devil is a liar. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Are you with me, somebody? The kingdom of God has not come in its fullness. We're not in heaven yet. We live in a sinful world with messed up people. And no matter how much you try to do good, somebody's going to do something messed up to you. Somebody's going to step on your toe. At some point, you're going to get offended. Somebody's going to do you wrong. That's just life. And if you allow the things that you're going through to, to speak to you, to suggest to you, or the voice of the enemy to come and preach a satanic gospel to you to tell you that if you were following God and if God really loved you, you would be more prosperous. If you allow that, you're going to leave God and you're going to run back out there to the world thinking that there's something to be gained. Hear me today. Here, I come to preach this today and rip the covers off. And so he tempts you in all of those areas. I can go give you a longer list. And then he, when, when he gets you down, then he begins to accuse you. He makes you feel like you're not capable of doing the things that God has called you to do. He makes you believe lies. Come on. He calls you to look more at your sin than at your Savior. And so you're sitting there ruminating about what you've done and how you wish you could go back and change it, but you can't. And sometimes you forget that this is not up to you. God saves you. It is God that keeps you. And even in your mess ups, come on somebody, he's adopted you. You heard Pastor Brian, he can't reject you now. He chose you knowing the mess you were in. And he knew that you were going to have to walk through some things before you get to the place of maturity. So I'm here to tell somebody this morning, I don't care where you were last night, what you did. Thank God you're in the house of the Lord this morning. Something tells me that you want what God has for you. Something tells me that something is awakened in you enough that you know that God has so much more. And even if you're still struggling with some things and seem like it doesn't want to let you go, you are still pressing forward in God. You are still moving towards your God. I want to tell you, keep moving towards him. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You're never wrong for staying close to God. What the enemy loves to do is to try to tell you, look where you were last night. You don't deserve to be amongst those people. You know that Nikayo is an anointed church. All those people are holy. Hello, you don't know what the guy next to you did last night either. You don't know where they've been, what they're into. Come on, somebody. You're going to sit there, let them lie to you and make you feel like you don't have a right to be in the place where God's presence lives. Come on, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, he does that just to keep you from rising. He makes you obsess over the irreversible consequences of your mistake. He makes you, listen, how many have ever been worshiping God or even in the presence of a holy moment and some crazy thought just goes through your mind? You'd be like, oh my God, what? I can't believe I'm thinking that. And then if you're a newbie, you'd be like, oh my God, I must not be saved. I must not be saved. I can't be thinking that if I'm really saved. And so this is what the devil does. Everything he does is to keep you from rising to the level of your potential. Accusations. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. And he talks about taking thoughts captive. You see, that's where the attacks are. Thoughts captive. It talks about imaginations and things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Remember, that's really where most of your battle is. Most of you will never see demons manifest and people turn around and crawl on the floor like serpents. Most of you never will never see that or be in that environment. I minister in different parts of the world and the demons in other parts of the world are not tame and educated like the demons in America. Demons up there behave themselves. You rebuke them, they go, okay, no problem. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. But you go to other parts of the world, my God, you might have to fight a little bit with them to get them out. I've seen one lady one time 
fall down on her back and just began to manifest. And I, folks, don't ask me how. It's like she had legs on her back. I saw her slide from there all the way up to the altar, manifesting a serpentine spirit. I don't know if you'll ever live to see that, but I'm coming to tell you that there's some stuff out there. And I want to give you some, 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 some thing to deal with the imaginations and the attacks on your mind that he, the enemy uses to keep you down. Amen. So how do we fight? The Bible says we need to stand firm in the faith. We need to resist him. We need to use spiritual weapons to fight spiritual war. If this was natural war, then we'd bring in the guns and the bombs and the bullets and the planes. If this was political warfare, then we would do, use the criticism and the attacks and the subterfuge and, the, and all of the sound bites that people use to, to defame and bring other people down. But this is spiritual warfare. And the Bible says if you're going to win at spiritual warfare, you then need to... Get the weapons that God has given you. So let me give you three weapons real quick that God has given you to fight with. Are you ready? Because I didn't come here today just to talk about the devil. I come to put him in his place. I came to rip the covers off and I came to give you the tools that you need to overcome. Hallelujah. So the first weapon that we need is the name of Jesus. Things change when we call that name. And it's not a coincidence. The Bible says in Ephesians, or Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus. Oh, I love to say that. At the name of Jesus. No matter what country I go to. Amen. No matter what kind of demons. At the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. If it's a Spanish country, en el nombre de Jesús. <laughs> Hallelujah. In Russia, it's Vaimya Jesus. It doesn't matter. As long as, I don't know what you call him, Jesus, Isusa, Jesus, Yeshua, the demons know who he is. You know why I love Jesus? I'm going to tell you why. Not just because he died for me. I'm going to tell you something. I love Jesus and I stay faithful to Jesus because I've seen this for myself. Every demon must bow in the name of Jesus. Do you know why I'm bold and do you know why I'm confident? It's not because of me. It's not because I'm Jamaican and I'm fierce and I have that kind of defined personality. It's got nothing to do with that. Devil doesn't care. It's because the one I serve, the Bible says God has highly, God has given him a name above every other name and God has highly exalted him such that when his name is uttered, in heaven everything bows. On the earth, those who love him today must bow and say, yes, you are Lord, you are Lord. And even under the earth, referring to the realm, the dark realms of Sheol, the spirit, the Bible says, even there, everything must bow to the glory of God the Father. Because the gods, the Father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. At his name, everything in creation must bow to him. The Bible says that God has exalted him far above all rule and principalities and powers and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the one to come. Every spirit, I don't care if it's in India, I don't care if it's African, I don't care what kind of witchcraft it is, every spirit must bow in the name of Jesus. i got to get the fear out of some of you because you all don't understand what you have is enough, that Jesus is enough. Some of you need to understand, you don't need to go see anybody. You don't need to carry anything in your pocket. You don't need no special bath. You don't need a talisman. All you need is Jesus. I want some of you to hear me today. The name of Jesus is authority to command. Would you open your mouth and say, Jesus. Respect that name. Honor that name. And when you call that name, heaven will respond. 
I learned this myself when I was a young Christian. I remember one time when I was freshly, you know, I got saved and, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the Caribbean. I used to live in the country, so, you know, I'm used to darkness, but I was always afraid of darkness because there was a lot of superstition around me growing up and, and a lot of it. I've seen some weird things happen in the country. You know, some of you, if you're Jamaican, you know, the thing called duppy. <laughs> <laughs> we call spirits, wicked spirits that walk at night. And I've seen some bad things happen. And so a lot of the superstitions may have been fed by our own beliefs. But I saw weird things happen in spite of the fact that those things were superstitions. And really, really, the reason why we fear is because we didn't really know that we had Jesus and that he was enough. As religious as we were, we didn't know. So when I came to America and started to, you know, I got saved. I got saved here. I wasn't saved there. And uh, I found myself living in my apartment as a single man for the first time. I, I didn't really, really, you know, deal with this issue about my fear of being alone into the dark. There's one particular night I went to sleep. And while I was sleeping out of nowhere, folks, I just felt this strong presence just come and sit right over me. And I was like, oh. I was trying to wake myself up and I couldn't wake up. I was half conscious, but I felt it. I literally felt like someone was holding me down in my bed, and I, I couldn't move. And I had already been delivered from that when I got saved, and this thing came back on me again. And I felt like I was being held down. I felt my chest being compressed, like someone laid a heavy thing, a slab across me. And I knew in my spirit what I needed to reach for. I knew what would change the equation. But my tongue was so heavy I could not speak. And the Spirit of God told me, just say it in your spirit. And I said, Jesus. And then my tongue loosened. And he said, now speak. And I said, Jesus. And folks, just like the speed of light, that thing just shot out of the room. I threw the covers off. I got up and I strolled around my house. And I began to declare the name of Jesus over my house. I didn't have a family yet. But I just got to rebuking and binding. I must have covered my generations before they got here. I just began to rebuke the, the hell out of the devil until it was out of my house. You can read the stuff and believe it, but until you lived it, you don't know it. Been there, done that. That's why I'm confident. Let me give you another one. There's the word of God. The other weapon that you need to use is the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In other words, the word is a sword. Ephesians 6 tells us that the, word, the, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. What does that mean, the sword of the spirit? It means that the word of God is the sword that the spirit uses to cut down other spirits. Hallelujah. And so what does that mean for me in application? It means I've got, to, I've got to learn the word, and I've got to learn to pray the word. Come on, somebody. It means I've got to learn how to walk around my house and declare the word over my family, over my children, over my situations. The word can change the realities. The word can reverse some things. Come on, somebody. You've got to replace the lies with the truth. And so you've got to learn how to take the word of God and speak that word with authority and confidence and speak it in the name of him who lived and died and rose again and ascended, who's seated at the right hand of the Father, who's coming again to judge the quick and the dead. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the one that everything in creation must acknowledge. When I speak the word, something has to change. So the name is the authority to command the word of God is a sword to wield. You've got to wield the sword. You wield it by speaking it in faith. How many of you speak the word? How many of you pray the word? I got to get you introduced to the Psalms. Get into the Psalms and start learning how to pray like David. Hallelujah. Blessed is the man who sitteth not in the counsel of the ungodly, who walk not in the counsel of the godly, or sit in the seat of the scornful. Begin to pray that. Lord, I thank you that I'm blessed. Thank you because I don't listen to, to, to ungodly people who mock you. Thank you. Begin to learn how to pray. The Psalms will get you there. God got Psalms that can game and you could stand against your enemy and speak some of those Psalms over your life. When you speak the word, you release the spirit to use a sword to cut some things down that was coming right after your family. Here's the last one. Tell somebody, speak the word. Speak the word. Here's the cross. The cross. 
No, I'm from the, from the old school, and we, we, we plead the blood over everything. I plead the blood all the time in my prayers. But the Lord brought this revelation to me front and center. We need to also learn how to apply the cross in spiritual warfare. We need to understand the cross occupies a very central place in our faith and in our belief system. And we need to begin to understand the theology of the cross. Now, let me just give you a few things today because I want you to add this to your toolkit. Amen, somebody. You need to pray all kinds of prayers, Ephesians 6 says. It, that everything you have to throw at the enemy, when you stand up to push back, you throw that at him. He says, after you've done everything to stand, stand some more. So the more I give you, the better it is. You say, it's overkill. Kill him and overkill him. That's what you need to do. Don't play with the devil. You need to overkill him. Coming up in here, trying to mess with my children. Come on. You know, start rebelling and start talking back and acting weird like you're not my child. Come on. You know, it's, it's, it's time for me to get after the devil that's behind that spirit of rebellion that's trying to rise up in my child and lead them astray. It's time for me to fight. Amen. Somebody say the cross. The cross. In John 12, 31, Jesus said, said something. He says, and, and now is the judgment of this world. And he said... And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And the concept of being lifted up, we have taken that to apply to worship. I believe we do exalt and lift the Lord up in worship. And I think we should do that. But I want to just tell you something. This is not what Jesus was referring to. If you read the next verse, 32, it says, This Jesus said in reference to the way in which he should die. Why is this important for your understanding today? Because there are different ways that Jesus could have died. At one time, they tried to stone him. But God did not ordain Jesus to leave here by stoning. Yeah. The Father didn't send him to die by stoning. The cross was specifically arranged for Jesus' exit. It is the doorway back into eternity. The devil was trying to stop him from going to the cross because the devil understood something Amen. After he tempted him in the garden and he realized that Jesus wasn't biting. Come on, somebody. He got nervous and scared because what he was trying to do was to preempt Jesus being lifted up. That is, suspended between heaven and earth, specifically dying on a cross. Hallelujah. Because the cross and the, the, the lifting up of Jesus portends of something powerful and awesome that you should know. Can I give you a theology of the cross this morning? And so Jesus could not leave this world other than through that doorway back into eternity. Oh my God in heaven. And so Jesus, the Bible says, if I die in this way, something's about to change. He says the devil will no longer be able to control humanity's mind unchecked. He will no longer be able to run roughshod over the human race and do as he pleases with people. Because me dying in this way is going to usher in a new era. I'm about to change some things around here is what Jesus was trying to tell you. And I'm going to do it by demonstrating through the cross, amen, the power that I have to change realities. What is he talking about? I'm coming, I'm coming. And so Jesus says... If I die on this cross, now listen, the Roman cross was the most feared instrument of death. You'd rather be stoned than crucified. Crucifixion was not something that you would choose if you had a choice of how do you want to go, by stoning, push you off of a cliff, by beheading you, or the cross. You would not say the cross. Just to say the cross, you'd almost lose control of your, mm -hmm. and so Jesus chose that way to go. Because what was once an instrument of death, wow, wow, wow. degradation, and shame, are you all listening to me? What once inspired fear, hallelujah, was about to meet its creator. How many of you know when the cross meets the creator, what the cross meant before has to change? What it stood for has to change, and it has to come stand for something else. And so that's what Jesus, the reality of your life, what you were, what you used to be, where you're coming from, what you've done. The day you meet the creator and the blood touches your life, please understand that that reality is about to change. What was your shame becomes your glory. Some of you need to know that because you don't want to testify 
You don't want to talk about where you've been, but just like Jesus took the cross and said, from now on, you'll be known as a symbol of life. You'll be known as a symbol of hope. People all over the world are going to hang you on the side of buildings. People all over the world are going to adopt you as a logo because it looks like hope from a distance. You see a cross, you say, there is the people of God. I want to be where they are. People are going to want to wear you around their necks because that's the reality. It's meant to flip that thing upside down and turn death into life, fear into hope. That's the beauty of the cross. That's why Jesus couldn't be stoned. If he was stoned to death, he would have died. In an, it would have been an accidental death. God ordained the cross as his way out of here. Is that good? There's more. There's more about the cross. And then I'm going to sit down. There's more. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, here's another significant thing. This is how you then apply this theology of the cross in spiritual warfare. You guys want to hear this? Yes. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says, And you, meaning you, you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, meaning Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Have you been forgiven? Wave at me, wave at me, wave at me. All the forgiven people, wave at me. Hallelujah. Don't it feel good? Hallelujah. Here, you're going to feel even better. Watch this. Watch this. Verse 14. How did he do it? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us. <laughs> and with its legal demands. In other words, I owed God for the sins I'd committed. I owed him for the life I had lived. And the devil would love to keep me thinking about all the stuff I've done. But you've got to see this. You've got to see this. This he set aside. That is my debt, my debt, my debt. Nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them in it. I think you missed what I said. In essence, what I just said was that and when the enemy comes after you, Tell them, devil, take out Colossians 2. Learn it by heart so you don't have to even grab your Bible. Learn this by heart. Tell them, devil, my debt has been canceled. And all the legal demands of the law have been fulfilled as it pertains to me. Tell them, devil, if you don't believe me, let me tell you about the cross. If you go to that old rugged cross, there you will find a handwritten note stained in the blood of Jesus with my name on top that says, Raymond, debt canceled. Oh, Toro Boshe. Debt canceled. Somebody say, debt canceled. Say it again, debt canceled. Say, my debt has been canceled. Now, the devil would love to try to get you, try to get around that, but this is why you have to remember the Bible says you were dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You can't get to me because I'm standing behind the cross. Come if you dare. Hallelujah. Oh, y'all don't hear me. The cross is powerful. The cross is powerful. And you've got to learn how to speak and remind the devil of his, of his Waterloo, of his place of defeat. You know something? Demons and devils remember things. There is, there is, they, they, they don't forget things. Hallelujah. And they, they remember. And they hope that you don't remember or that you don't know what Jesus has done and that there's so much in the word and that what you need to do is help to refresh their memories. Hallelujah. You need to help refresh their memories. This is why you need to, you need to, you remember those Dracula movies? When the Dracula used to strike terror in everybody's heart. You know, even me, as I know it was a movie, but I'd be scared. I'd be going to my bed, making sure I close all my windows, making sure that, you know, he was just coming like a bat, you know, under your window, and then he'll just come in your room, and, and I'd be scared. Y'all remember Dracula? You young people don't know who Dracula is, right? 
But see, I grew up with Dracula. I understand what that fear was, but I also knew that whenever Professor Van Helsing walked into the room, or if he went to mess with somebody and they were wearing a cross, he'd be, ah! Oh. Now, that may seem comical to you, but I submit to you that it's the same reaction the devil will have when he tries to mess with you, and you said, okay, come at me, come at me, come at me. I'm hiding behind the cross of Jesus. If I am dead and my life is hidden with him, I dare you, I dare you. You'd have to defeat the one who defeated you, and that is not even possible. You can't touch me. I want to remind you today, if you expect to win in spiritual warfare, use the weapons God gives you. Stand on your feet, stand on your feet. I want to pray and release something over you right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, throw your hands up. In the name of Jesus, right now, Father, we thank you for, the, for your name. It is the power to command. I want you to open your mouth and command some things to go from you. Come on, speak up. Some of you are going through some things. Begin to use your prophetic anointing. Don't be passive. Come on, release. Command some things. In the name of Jesus. Hey, thank you for your name. Thank you for your name. Thank you for the name that is above every other name. We release the power of your name over your people, over their lives. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, thank you for the cross. Come on, some of you are struggling. The thoughts and the attacks on your mind. You need to begin to release the word now. You tell the devil. You address the devil. And you tell him in the name of Jesus. I'm hiding behind the cross. God's got me. My victory is in that cross. There's a note there with my name on it that says my debt is canceled. Tell him, tell him, tell him. You can't touch me. You can't touch my children. The Bible said that my household will be saved. Come on. My children will be saved. My husband, my wife, my mother, my father, anything with my name on it that's not saved is about to get saved in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give him the glory. Come on and lift him up. Say, Jesus. There's power in the name. There's power in his word. There's power in the cross. And listen, we're going to be dismissed. But as Bishop preached so powerfully, the cross canceled your debt. Your sin is forgiven. How do we receive that? You believe that. And some of you have been saved. But there was a sin or two that you've clung. Lord, did you, can you forgive that? Your sin is not greater than your Savior. There's no sin too great. Murder, abortion, adultery, infidelity, the, the, the stuff that you thought, if somebody knew this, God forgave that. For some of you who've never had your sins forgiven, you just learned about the power of the cross, that what was death is now life, what was a sin and bound, now I'm free. All we have to do is say yes. The Bible declares if anyone believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, so before we leave, we can't leave this moment without giving you an opportunity to be saved because you can't hide behind a cross you're not a part of. You can, you can wear it, you can be around it, but it's not just the symbol of it. It's your identification with it. And so, simply, if you have never prayed a prayer of what we call salvation to be saved, where we basically were just saying, yes, Lord, I believe that you did 2, 000, over 2,000 years die on that cross for me. Bishop said in the first service, really quickly, he said that you, you were hung naked on the cross, which was to shame you. Some of you, you, you may have forgiven your sin, but you didn't release your shame. He took your shame. He lifted up your shame so that you didn't have to carry it. So if you've never prayed a prayer and said yes to God, this is your moment. And in that moment, everything you've ever done, God will forgive. He already has. You just receive it. And for some of you, you've, you've prayed that prayer before, but you went back into a lifestyle and you're questioning, God, are you? You really will? Am I really behind the cross? This same prayer will fix that. And you will leave here knowing that you are hidden with Christ and alive with him. So I want everybody, it, 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 really quickly, if you need that prayer, you, you need that prayer, 
never prayed that prayer, but I, want my, I need my sins forgiven. I, I, I want to live for God because this, I, I'm done with living for the enemy. I want to live for God. Is that you? Can I, can I see your hand? Like you've never prayed that prayer, but you're saying, Pastor, I need that prayer. Can I see your hand? You need Jesus in your life. You need your sins forgiven. Come on, lift it high. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I see. Come on, lift it. Lord, I, I, I feel like I believe. I want to confess. Maybe some of you, I want you to lift your hand right here. If I've done that, Pastor, but I went back out and I need to know. Like, I need to know I'm right. Can you lift your hand? Yeah, hands all over the room. Young man in the back, God bless you. My sister, God bless you. And we're going to help them as a mighty army. I want all of you just to simply, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you will be saved. The cross is finished. It's not a decision in God's mind if he'll save you. He already did it. You just have to believe it and receive it. So I want us all to pray. Father, thank you for loving me and sending your son to die on the cross, to forgive my sins, to take my shame, to heal my diseases, and to deliver me from every work of the evil one. And I believe now I belong to you. I'm saved. I'm hidden in the cross. In Jesus' name.